But it should be a fun. How many people were here yesterday for a training or a summit or? Nice. We got some diehards. That's awesome. And while we're just waiting for people to come in, just a quick poll in the room. Um, how many people, this is their first DrupalCon? Woo! Welcome to DrupalCon! Cool. And how many people are um, new to Drupal within the last year? Awesome. The last two years? Three years? Four years? Five years, six years, ten years? Ten years. We got some ten years. Woo! Yeah. All right. I know. My D. O. account actually got hacked, so my um, and it got compromised, so I had to shut it down. So it shows that I'm only on D. O. for six and some years, but it's actually been over eight. So, yeah, I had to get Neil Drum to fix that. It was a bad scene. Okay. There's supposed to be an AV person coming to check on me, but I think I'm okay in case they show up. So we'll go ahead and get started here because we're just one, like, 30 seconds or 5 o'clock on the nose. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome to uh, my session this afternoon. I'm happy to welcome you. My name is Anne Stefanik. I'm the founding CEO of Canopy Studios. I've been working in Drupal since about 4 or 6 back in the days of FlexiNode, for those that are familiar with FlexiNode. So today, um, this is just a little bit where you can find me online. I run a company called Canopy Studios. And um, today, my presenter's notes are not the same, but we're okay. Um, today, we're gonna talk about employee engagement and what it means for your bottom line. So I purposely started Canopy Studios as a distributed agency, and in terms of employee engagement, working a distributed model has its own unique challenges, but today I'm gonna to talk a little bit more in general terms. Canopy still has our first employee and has the majority of the clients that we've worked with. Um, we, all, the, all of our contractors that have worked with us, if they're high quality, they've become full-timers, and um, we go out of our way at Canopy to make everybody feel at home and like it's a good place to work. Um, well, I founded Canopy, the company is where today, thanks to the awesome team. We, I thought it would be maybe an eight-person shop, and since October 2013, when I really started really pushing Canopy as a professional agency, we grew from just me to now 24 full-time employees. So it's been a lot of growth over the last few years, and a lot of this has happened directly as a result of our employees. They've been happy, they've kept our staff, or our clients happy, and they've encouraged other people to join our team. So before I get started, just a quick show of hands of how many are super in love with their job. Yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. And how many people are like okay with their job? They're satisfied, they like it. And how many people here are looking for a new job? Okay, all right, all right. Um, so, um, and just a quick show of hands, how many people are bosses or manage people? Okay, cool. All right. So, um, employment is a really a mutual connection and commitment between the employee and the employer. So I understand this is our last session of the day, and um, the number one reason that people like their jobs is usually their employees, their other staff members. So because it's the end of the day, oops, this is not going to work for me. I just wanted to, ah, where's my mouse? We are going to go to page. We're going to get up out of our chairs and we're going to have some fun. So. Let me see if I can get this going. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Okay, everybody up. And if you're not comfortable getting up, you can stay in your seat. But we just gotta shake it out. Shake it out. So you do this? It's all about 
being happy, guys. Let's get her happy on. Feel that happy. Woo! See all these people, they're happy. All right, all right. So we're all feeling energized. We're all feeling good. Let's turn off this nonsense. Uh, somehow. Back to this one second. I have a trick. There we go. The mute button does wonders. Okay, so where's our presentation? That seemed like a really good idea at the time. Okay, we'll get rid of you. And where's our presentation? Let me just, sorry guys, this was a technical error here. Let me just go here and just for a second. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, apologies. Should come over there. Yay, okay. Great, so now that we're all jazzed, I'm gonna share some kind of depressing news. So um, believe it or not, in America, disengaged employees make up over 71% of the workforce. What's disturbing about that is that's um, more likely that disengaged employees are negative, unproductive, and out of the office more. I think we have a pretty magical community here in Drupal, and a lot of people really love what they do. And there's a lot of companies that make sure they take care of their employees. So this is kind of the blob of all of the companies in the US. I think it's probably a little bit different in Drupal, but we don't have those stats. So today we're gonna cover some key points. We're gonna talk about what the culture of engagement and why is it important. We're gonna talk about some of the drivers. We're gonna talk about some of the foundational steps that need to happen within a company. We need to talk about the management level. And then finally we'll end off with some perks, benefits, and extras. Okay, so what is the culture of engagement and why is it important? So as a starting place, engagement has replaced wellness as the new catch-all buzzword. But let's define what wellness means and why wellness is different from engagement. Wellness is the idea by keeping people physically happier or physically healthier, they will be more productive. Hence why you see more options for uh, healthy lunches or riding your bike to work. Engagement is the idea that an organization creates conditions in which the employee has free choice and has an intrinsic desire to work on the best, work in the best interests of the organization. So why is engagement more important for retention? So disengaged employees, <laughs> they rarely produce new solutions or bring innovative ideas to the table. They have little interest in contributing to the bigger picture and being creative. They often mindlessly go through their jobs and they don't remember any of their conversations if they've had any at all. So why not just fire disengaged employees? Well, first off, that's not actually gonna solve your problem. And it could potentially ruin your reputation. Negative feedback tends to be magnified more than good. And your company's reputation could, and credibility could be damaged by just one disgruntled employee. So, as any business owner knows, turnover is very expensive. Some studies predict that every time a business loses a salaried employee, it takes six to nine months of that salary on average to replace them. So for example, if an employee is making $80,000 a year and they leave, it potentially costs us $40,000 to $60,000 in recruiting and training expenses. The fact is that happy, content relationships are less likely to break up. And that's true both in our professional life as well as our personal life. So companies have tried all kinds of tactics to get employees to enjoy work, from beer fridges to pool tables to snack rooms. I live in San Francisco and I've seen all kinds of different employee engagement tactics. If you've been down to the Facebook or the Google campus, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, while all those things may be able to keep employees at the office longer, Ultimately, employees are interested in increasing and making a difference within the company. 
So having an engaged workforce makes the employee feel more engaged in the mission, vision of the company itself, not just the perks of working there. It's important to remember that boosting employee engagement isn't simply about creating a cooler office space. Employee engagement is an investment in your mission and should be treated as a two-way street. So according to a Gallup poll, with engaged employees, they perform over 200% better. I've seen stats that are even higher than that. And employees, when they feel like their work is meaningful, they work harder. Employees feel satisfied, they're better communicators, and they're more creative when they're engaged. They thrive on knowing they can find new ways of completing tasks on, and looking at things freshly. They're satisfied with their careers, and they're generally happier as humans. Furthermore, they help attract top talent and will help evangelize your organization, whether you're service-based or cause-based. So, I want to, we're talking a lot about disengaged employees. There's another set which are called satisfied employees. Those are the people that aren't necessarily unhappy or disgruntled, but satisfies employees are there to give. Engaged employees are there to, or sorry, satisfied employees are there to get versus engaged employees are there to give. So if you look at a satisfied person in their job, they're usually doing their job, they're looking at making themselves successful, and they have a personal commitment to the organization. Versus engaged employees, it's about doing the job over and above. It's about making myself and the company successful. And it's a mutual commitment. So we've talked a little bit about what engagement is and why it's important. Let's talk for a minute about the drivers of engagement. If you're trying to build a culture of engagement, Knowing what your company stands for is a very, very crucial step. You have to know your mission, your vision, and your purpose. It all gives your company a rallying point and something your employees and your clients can get behind. Also, for those in management or leadership positions, based on research, inspirational leadership can be the perk. Without it, it may feel like the organizational is rudderless and headless. I've seen great companies that when their leader leaves, the company doesn't do as well. It's because that energy of the leader is bringing the, the vivaciousness to the company. So know who you are, know who your company is, and, and be bold. So with the drivers of engagement, the first part is to define and evangelize. Again, your mission is what guides the actions in, in the organization. It spells out the overall goals and provides a path for decision making. For example, at Canopy, we are honest, fun, transparent, clear, curious, and caring. We're empowered to make decisions collectively to build a company that makes a difference. The vision, the vision is what the owner or the founder of the company wants the company to achieve in the future, what the strategic direction is. So at Canopy, we're a real data-driven company with focus on excellent customer service. We value freedom above all else, which is freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom to do what's right for the client, for the community, for the company, freedom to be creative, freedom to work and do and work wherever it suits you best. But with this commitment to results and the metrics to measure these, we can easily see success and we can easily measure that and celebrate it. And then your purpose is really like why your company exists. Like what's the fundamental reason? So our purpose is to build awesome websites that not only are beautiful to look at, but also are expertly coded. So the, the purpose of bringing this up is that your leadership team, it's their responsibility to carry this mission out and to communicate it. All of your staff, if you ask them at any given time what our vision is, they should be able to say it without looking at a book or finding out where, where, where they're at. So you also want them to be involved in the evolution of ideas. When we were trying to build our value set, we did a workshop. And I said, OK, this is what I think we're valuing. Are we actually valuing that? And some people were a little timid because I'm a high extrovert. And I'll talk about this a little later. but. Oh, we work with a lot of introverts. So for me to stand up there and be like, okay, what's our values? Let's go, all right, go, 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 go. It's a very intimidating and intense place 
So we created a, a space where everybody could collaborate asynchronously and come online and work on that or contribute in a way that was more easy for them to share. So when we found that people are engaged with the mission, the value, and the purpose, they become emotionally attached to the vision and they believe in what the organization stands for. They'll be more committed and they'll be more loyal. You also, it's really important to clarify roles and the expectations of those roles. This is something that if you're a fast-growing company, your employees may or may not have job descriptions. A lot of mine didn't. And if you don't have some of those expectations that are clear and some of the basic materials and equipment provided, boredom may result. And when boredom is there, your employee may spend more time thinking about how they can be relevant versus how they can help your organization succeed. How many organizations here are under 20 people? Yeah, over 30? Okay. So, um, two things about that. One, we're a very small, flat organization of 24. So there's not a lot of room for middle management. It just absolutely actually doesn't exist. So when we're talking about career advancement, and we're more talking about an increase in skill set, an increase in client touch, an increase in responsibility, and less about elevated titles. When someone comes to me and says, I want a job, but I want this title, I think, oh my goodness, that person, no matter how awesome they are, they're never going to work here because they're going to want this middle management tier that I'm not interested in offering. So when you're thinking about, you know, when you're working with a small business like of the 30 and under kind of space, you're looking at setting clear expectations. And working with them about potential career advancements is crucial. These discussions around goals, skill development, and changes in responsibility can be very motivating. If it's never discussed, they may just leave and you won't know until it's too late. If you're in a larger organization and you have middle management, it's so imperative that your managers are super clear on who they're supposed to manage and what are those results. I highly believe that a disengaged, well, it's, it's a fact that a disengaged manager equates to disengaged staff. So if your managers are disengaged or satisfied, it's time to seriously look at if they're being effective because they will essentially cause attrition with your team. If you're a small company like us, we do a couple of tools and tactics when people get onboarded so they're familiar with the other people in the company. Remember, people like to work at companies because of all the other people that work there. Um, I run with Carson and a bunch of other people, the Bay Area Drupal Camp. A lot of us used to work at Chapter 3, when we left, we still wanted to work together. So we kept working on Bad Camp. It gave us meaning, it gave us connection. So if knowing that people is the fundamental number one reason, it's, it's not about working on meaningful projects. It's not about building the best modules or you know, ex, you know, pushing the most awesome code out there. It's really about the connections that we share. So it's really easy in a small organization to know everybody, but as you scale or you get a little bit busy, bigger, it's, it's really important to put in some tools and tactics to be able to stay connected. I recently learned about this tool called Know Your Company, which is a really cool thing. We do this all through Google Docs, so someone comes on board first day, they fill in their first day thing, which is more of like, how, you know, who are you, what do you do? And all of that gets, dis, gets spread out so everybody else can learn about each other. Know Your Company is kind of a, more t a bigger tool for companies that are like 30 people and over, but it allows to have some of that dynamic connections, especially if you're in a remote business and don't have the opportunity to meet face to face. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, a lot of this again is that providing the, the clear vision, providing a clear solid ground of roles and responsibilities and expectations, but the next one comes to course correction. Delivering feedback can be really scary, and it also is the key to giving your employees a sense of where they're going. And because it's so uncomfortable, a lot of people just put it off, or they only focus on praise. But engaged employees want to know where they stand, they want honest, transparent conversation, and in order to understand how to better serve the organizational goals and within the boundaries of, of what they're working with. Employee engagement is a direct reflection of the relationship with their manager, like I mentioned before. And really, again, if that management relationship is fractured, no amount of perks will encourage those people to perform at top levels. 
Finally, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot, is honest, transparent communications. At Canopy, we're totally distributed, so we have a few things in place to stay connected. We have an all hands every week, or every other week. And one of those, one is to play games and have fun and do silly things and just like hang out, but the other one is to share company information and share you know, what's happening in the company. Then we have a quarterly town hall. And our quarterly town hall is a time when the managers come together and they share key information about what's happening and I'm totally transparent about all our financials in that meeting. Just a quick poll of hands of the managers or bosses, how many people share their financials with their employees? <laughs> Yay, that is a good sign, that is a good sign. I um, just learned to do this recently and my goodness, what it, it's pretty amazing what that does. So, you know, when you're talking about um, connecting, we also have what we call a Friday friendly dev scrum. So every Friday, everybody gets on and it's a five minute, like, what are you working on? But more importantly, what are you doing on the weekend? What's happening in your personal life? Those kinds of, especially if you're distributed because we don't have the water cooler, or the lunches together, it's really important to create that sense of community. And then I personally meet with all of our employees at least once a quarter and I cherish those times because I get to hear things that maybe they didn't want to talk to their manager about or you know, maybe they, they're, they're wanting to talk to, to HR about career advancement but they don't know quite how to do it or you know, however that is. So it's a really great place to have an open and keep that open door for them to come to you. So it's really, really, really key to be transparent about organizational health because that can really propel your employees to act strategically, involve them in their strategy and they will improve your process. So, let's talk about some steps that need to happen within a company. First off, recognize that your, your employees are just as important as your clients. Create this realistic, honest recognition system. Communicate, again, clear, transparent, direct. And celebrate the work that they do. Let employees know that they're contributing. Show them how they're contributing to the bottom line and how they're making a difference. It's really impactful um, for them to see, well, we don't share maybe full spreadsheets just to show pie charts or graphs to generally show, and we can show that, you know, if there's a pie chart of all the sales, and this is all the new business, but this business came from upsells and support, and this came from upsells in the, the, the professional services, then all the team members are like, oh yeah, I helped there, I did that, that's awesome. And so those kind of things really help people understand where the company is going, and then they can feel part of the solution. So I'm such a big fan of communication, I want to just dive into that just a little bit more here. So we forget that when we're on the top tier of information, so many of our employees are not privy to the information we have. And assumptions can breed fear and grow a rumor mill. If you're worried about something, the chances are your staff are already talking about it. So here's an example. In Q4 of 2016, Canopy hit our very first rough patch. And we had a few clients that just decided to stop work due to the changes in the economic situation. We work with a lot of nonprofits and they just were absolutely terrified. They're funding. So when we're looking at that, I was terrified. I was like, oh my goodness, we're going into Christmas. We had two of our biggest clients fall out. I'm terrified. What if I can't, like, what happens? We have this reserve. We're going to be okay, but I'm stressing out. And so I turned to the direct managers, and we have three, aside from um, my sister who's VP of Ops, and I said, hi, so I have to show you something, and I'd like everybody to sit down and take a nice deep breath, and we're going to get through this, but I need to show you something. I said, based on these projects falling out and all of our staff being full-time, da 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 and they all said, we got gotcha. you. We're going to do this together. How can I help? And I was like, really? You're not freaking out? And they're like, well, yeah, we're freaking out. Yeah, we're freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> but we're freaking out with you. <laughs> we're all going to be okay. Because we always get through this. And then next thing you know, I was like, okay, so we got this town hall coming up, and it's like the first time it's not going to be like roses and sunshines and sparkles. And they were like, let's start with the side about roses and sunshines and sparkles, and that it's not always this way. And I was like, okay. So that was the first time I really took my financials to the team. Because I never really thought it was something they needed to see. But my goodness, was it impactful. When I was able to be honest and clear and transparent about where we were, what happened? 
The team got together, they huddled, they came up with solutions, they went and were like, oh, this support client, I know they have some hours to spend before year end. We can get them to sign a 100-hour change order right now. We've just been too busy to deal with it. Okay, so next thing you know, I had the team coming up with creative solutions, they were willing to work on blog posts or marketing, anything they could do to further and make sure that Canopy was gonna be okay for the long term. And we're stronger today because of it. We know we have each other's back when times might get a little rough. And we all know that working in the agency space, it's like this. It's a roller coaster. And fortunately in Drupal, it's been a pretty awesome up roller coaster. But economic, chi economic changes can change, like economic clients can change, and therefore we can be put into unique situations that we weren't expecting at all. The employees are constantly watching leadership. They're watching leadership to see their decisions and how it affects. They want to see how their behaviors, like what they say, are they going to do what they said? So it's really important to not only say what you're going to do and then do that, but it's also important to have feedback. So um, as a business owner, that really means we need to make time for the managers to manage. We need to take an honest look at billability and profitability and try to communicate transparently. I am the number one person to find, oh, you're a really capable manager? Well, guess what? I'm going to put so much on your plate, <laughs> right? So as, as, as the boss lady, I need to really be mindful to say, okay, no, Fridays is her one-on-one -on -one days. We have to figure that out. But it takes some give and take, and it takes some learning, and it takes your manager being brave to say, I have too much work. I've got to take care of my, my staff. I need to do this. And that's really hard when you've got client pressures and you've got you know, launches pending and so forth. But those conversations, they're so fundamental that it's, it's okay to push a one-on-one. -on -one. It's okay to move things around. Your staff is gonna be totally understanding. But if you ignore your staff for two or three months and they've got something they, they feel like they're holding out for, then all of a sudden they feel disgruntled and they may move into that satisfied category and then they may move into disgruntled and actually leave. So speaking of communication, I want to talk a little bit about introverts. They're highly cerebral and creative people. I am a uber extrovert. So I am probably, I realize, very intense for a lot of my staff. I read a book recently recommended by one of my staff because he is engaged and wants the company to be awesome and he knows I'm very loud. Um, I'm, I, my nickname is Mack Truck in the morning. Bah, bah, bah. So <laughs> when we're looking at, um, he recommended this book, and if everybody works in this industry, I'd highly recommend it's called Quiet, The Power of Introverts by Susan Cain, I think. But Quiet, The Power of Introverts, you're going to find it. And it really helped me greatly understand my team and how to work in a way that works best for them. And again, it was one of my employees that came and said, you're an extrovert that manages like 20 introverts, you need this book. Because he cares. So investing in your team and understanding goes a long way. And listening, if I just threw that book on my desk and kept working, he probably wouldn't have felt so good, even though he's like super jazzed about what he's doing. And so knowing that this fundamentally changed the way that we work with employees and um, it's, it's just about things like I prepare information in advance and I give, them, give it to them in advance to prepare. The, the shotgun approach of me being like, let's work on our values. I read this book, fortunately, beforehand and I realized my traditional method of like, let's brainstorm, let's get in a group and talk about it, is really overwhelming and intimidating. Um, so what we did is that by switching this format, we got a better response and more people felt like they could actually collaborate and connect. Um, as we read this book, we're a big, advocate of diversity and um, this really helped understand how our team is very diverse and we also required our managers to understand that they still have to provide boundaries if you're going to give information to an employee to dig into and they like to wormhole and go really deep give them boundaries so they know where the edges are and that you have that again that consistent feedback so you can check in with them so Remember to always, always, always remain to, and can create that communication, that environment for that where communication can foster. Your team wants to be part of the solution. So just to sum up in uh, communications, really be willing to have those conversations, good, bad, performance, about leadership. If you're really busy, stop what you're doing, turn off Slack, turn off your email, sit there, look them in the eye, and talk. 
So many managers are on multitasking because they feel like they have to or they won't catch, they won't be able to catch a breath. But it's so important if your employees feel like they're coming to you and you're not focused, then like, they're like why, why are we even having this one-on-one? -on -one? Another one is be really good at addressing situations directly and immediately and with consistency. Nobody wants to be in trouble, but sometimes things go wrong. So it's really important to not save it for the review in three months, is to bring it up right away and have an honest, transparent conversation where you're like, so, you know, this, this thing happened, this launch, maybe, you know, whatever the situation is, and you ask them for like, how did you think it went? And how do you feel about the situation? How do you think you could improve? Because most often people know when they screw up. And they don't mean to, it's usually an accident. I tell everybody, you can screw up lots. Just try not to screw up at the same thing. You know, we all make mistakes. It's just you can't make the same mistake over and over because then that's, that's not good. Be willing to take suggestions and act on them. If you're, do, if you're willing to change based on what feedback they give to you, they'll be more willing to open up. Just like when I got that book, if I wouldn't have read it, I probably would have shut down. But because I read it, we were able to have this really rich conversation, and it directly impacted how the company, it, how the company works together. And finally, invest in your management team. At Canopy, we invested in an HR manager. Hiring a senior HR manager facilitated leadership training and support for staff and professional growth, and my goodness, did it help a lot when I had to have difficult conversations. Because it's inevitable when you're managing people. At first, everyone was like, what, we're getting HR? <laughs> um, okay, I'm really scared. Am I gonna be fired? I was like, no, 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 no. The reason, and we responded, I said, we're hiring HR because we care about our company and we want Canopy to be here for the long term. We care about our collective happiness and we care about diversity. We only hire people at Canopy that have proven experience. So as you can imagine, career pathing for senior folks is incredibly challenging. A lot of them were once contractors, so maybe they're not quite used to working in a day job. It's a little bit different of a structure. And as the CEO, I can only do so much. Because we had such awesome staff that were so engaged, every single developer was turning to me and be like, oh, I super love what I'm doing, how do I be better? And I'm like, I, 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 I don't know. I come from an account services background, I come from, from sales, business development, and while I am very technical, I am not a developer. So when I had 18 developers turning to me for career pathing, I was like, well, okay. So, A, we hired a director of engineering who's super badass. Her name's Kat. She's right there. Woo! Um, <laughs> but the, the, the nice part about that is that, of course, she's the director of engineering, so career pathing, well, it is part of her job. We really needed an HR manager to help that. So together, Erin and Kat work really closely to provide a good, solid foundation. We got to rewrite all the job descriptions, and we really had to, because we had grown so organically, everything was all over the place. Like, it was really messy. And people that came in way long ago, they, I mean, the new people had job descriptions, but the old people, and they're like, am I a tech lead, or am I a senior developer, or am I, you know? So creating this like baseline and working with that, and because I strongly believe that technical people should be managed by technical people, having that role with Kat and Aaron blended to really support the employees, they felt really heard, and they felt like they could connect with their managers and, and really move forward. So um, let's talk a little bit about perks, benefits, and extras that can help foster management and engagement. Some of these things cost money, um, but in honest, honestly, some of the most effective methods we have for employee engagement are totally free. Okay. So, um, employees want the opportunity to develop and grow professionally. That's hands down, um, either it's they love working with their staff or they have career advancement opportunities. All of the other stuff is definitely important, but those two are the fundamental two core things. So, having a defined professional development plan for both the company and for the employees is wonderful for your recruiting, and train and recruiting tactics. You can help them see themselves there. Again, building that plan can be as simple as looking through job descriptions, defining expectations, coaching employees. This, so employees, again, cite that their primary reason for enjoying work is strong employee engagement. 
And um, this often may come from like happy hours, inner office cook-offs, or picnics. But in, case, but in the case of Canopy, while we're totally distributed, this looks a little bit differently. You see these tacos here? Tacos have actually become a huge part of our culture. Like, I love tacos to start with, but there's this app on Slack, and it's called Hey Taco. And I highly recommend um, what we did at Canopy Studios is we have Slack. I'm sure everybody uses Slack. Most people use Slack, or, or I'm sure another form of communications. And we have a channel called Thanks. Everybody's in the channel. And what we do is we put Hey Taco in the channel. So totally free for one channel. If you want to put it in all channels, it's like $1 per person. And that taco app, people can give each other tacos. They're like, great job on the launch. Thanks for helping out with documentation. And this thanks channel, people have gone nuts over it. They thank each other every day. They show up in the morning. They, some of them, like you only get five tacos a day. You run out of tacos. We have 24 people. And we're like, I have more people to thank. And they're like, can you thank this person for me? They did an awesome job. And like people are logging in on the weekends. I have 10 tacos to give away this weekend. Like I'm giving away all my tacos. And like these stupid gifts come up in our things and it's like, you've received your 80th taco and it's like this taco man. It is the stupidest thing and we love it. So if you take nothing away from this presentation other than installing Hey Taco on a thanks channel, that, that's gonna make your employees like super stoked. So I vote on that. Um, another one that we do is we hold open office hours where we just open up a Slack channel or a Zoom channel. We're a video first company. So we believe that if you are working from home, you need to get dressed and, I mean, I always say pants are optional as long as you don't stand up, right? We do, we do encourage pants because someone, the doorbell does ring. Um, but <laughs> you're, you're looking at like people coming on video so you can connect with them, you can see their eyes. It's so important when you're working in a distributed company or even in the office to like connect and say, hi, how you doing? So while we like to jump right into business, we're very fast moving, we like to get stuff done, we always take just a few minutes at the front of the, each meeting. How's it going? How's your cat? How's your baby? Often we see their cats going across the screen anyways, so we know their cats very well. <laughs> um, but really those co-working sessions and those video chats are integral to creating um, a connection. We also create a peer-to-peer -peer, um, buddy system for new employees. So when new employees come on board, they're gonna have their manager and they're probably gonna ultimately you know, report to me or whatnot. We're gonna have our managerial stuff, but then we'll peer them with someone that doesn't do what they do. So for example, um, we have a new support developer who's come on board. He might get, get paired with the designer. And it's more to talk about company culture, some of those things that are the in-between. So um, when Carlos started, he's like, oh, so where do I find this? Or how do I go there or whatnot? And they can ask those questions to their peers without having to maybe go to their direct manager because they feel like, oh, I should have read that already. Or maybe it's somewhere I have already was supposed to look. And because you don't know anybody, it's, we create those peer-to-peer -peer groups. And that really helps create a foster of bonding. We also believe that no developer should ever be thrown under the bus ever. Software development is hard. What our jobs are are hard, and we deliver big websites. We also deliver small websites, but often the reality is is that we want to protect our team and we want to go to bat for our team. Things screw up, but Canopy takes the ownership. Canopy takes the responsibility. And while we may on our back channels and really help and coach that employee to a place of better improvement and better performance, ultimately we're there to protect and trust each other. So there is also the um, competitive pay. There is, um, most often employees don't leave a job for a bigger salary, unless it's substantially bigger. Like if they're going from 50K to 500K, like I would, I would do that job too. But I mean, really happy employees are willing to do more with less in exchange for life work balance, strong professional relationships, and an input into the direction and management of the company. So while pay and benefits are a key indicator of employee engagement, or sorry, if, if they're not the key indicator of employee engagement, offering competitive compensation benefits and reasonable working conditions should be a part of your overall strategy. For example, I force vacation. 
if you're on vacation and I see you on Slack or on your email, you are officially in trouble, like officially. We know if there's an emergency, we can call your cell phone. We know there's cell phones. Other than that, you need to uninstall Slack on your phone, you need to sign out a Gmail, you need to let it all go. We don't deliver babies, we build websites, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna be okay. Um, but forcing vacation is, is something that's really important because people need to relax. Okay, so engagement is about capturing your employees' heads and their hearts. resulting in discretionary effort, which is the magic dust, leading to superior business results. So, thank you so much for coming today. I've got some time for Q&A. Because the magic dust really is in happy employees. So, I hope you all had fun dancing, and you're gonna take some of these things home to spread your own magic dust around with your staff. I'm happy to take questions, so I just ask that you use the microphone and introduce yourself first, if that's the case. Hi, my name is Kendra, um, and we have an employee who's just poison in terms of our culture, but he's actually vital to a lot of our projects. So he's super smart, but He's a jerk. He's a jerk to everybody. He's very condescending. He thinks he's better than everybody, but man, he's genius. So how would you deal with that? Have you started recruiting for his replacement? It's almost, in our area, it's very difficult to find people with this level of expertise in yeah. server management. So we're, we're thinking about it, but any tips on how to handle him and how to handle him with the employees while we're trying to figure out how to replace him? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is, have you had a conversation with him about the impact that he's making on the business? Multiple times. Can you send him to work from home? Yes. Yeah, if he's, if he's very poisonous to your organization, he will be poisoning all of your other employees. He's like a vortex, he'll be taking down your other staff. And honestly, it may cost you more in your business to keep him on board than to feel the pain of letting him go. We had a rock star, an absolute rock star that I loved. And, and, but when it came down to being actually kind and compassionate towards other humans and it didn't fit, we let her go because it just wasn't worth it, even though she was a total rock star. And we suffered. We had to like pull together and be like, okay, we have no idea what we're doing here. We gotta figure this out. And I think it's so important to build redundancy into roles so that nobody ever becomes the one and only thing that drives, you know? Because that's so dangerous for you as an organization because if he decides to flip the table and burn, he will do it in a really bad way. And that's very dangerous. So, Politely ask him to work from home. Maybe he contributes via voice or something if he's being condescending and, and so forth. And honestly, I would start writing him up because if you do have to let him go and you haven't done the proper paperwork, he's the kind of guy that's gonna come and sue you. So do, put the paperwork, because it's the paperwork that's gonna protect you. And even though we're a very married, like I'm sure it's at will for a lot of people that bring on employees, protecting yourself and your employees is a, is a really important part. And it might be something like, if he's a super rock star, I mean, we're all real rock stars. I'm sure there's maybe even a contractor that could help part time. If, if there's uh, maybe team members can take on, you might wanna go to your other team members and say like, hey, you know, Jack does these 17 things. Can you do one of them, any of them? Oh yeah, I can actually do four. You might be surprised what your other team members can take off of his plate, so that if you do need to let him go without a replacement, maybe there's only three things that are missing. Because I was, I was like one of those things where I kind of turned and, and I found out that, hey, you know, there's, we have really great copywriters in house and I had no clue, right? We have our design, we have our, one of our themers that's like, hey, I can do UX. I can do UX, so you can, oh, okay, cool, let's do it. But you know, having those conversations are so important, and I think being honest with your team members to let them know, hey, we understand that you know, Jack's been really hard on you, so do you wanna talk about anything? Are you okay? Because it's the other team members that really you kinda need to be worried about, because those are the ones that may leave as a result because you haven't dealt with Jack. So I'm sorry you're in that situation, though. That's a tricky spot. Yeah, okay. 
Should we get back to dancing or any other questions? Hi there, I'm uh, Sebastian. Um, I'm running an agency that's growing a lot right now, and for us, we have a very large contractor pool, well, for me, very large contractor pool, 12 people. And I was wondering um, to what extent today's topic could be also applicable to a contractor pool? Like how many, how many of these principles would you, cons yeah, would you apply to, to that kind of a workforce? Yeah. Do you, um, do you plan to bring them full time ever? We, yeah, right now we're growing a lot, so once things stabilize, I'm perhaps, I mean, it depends how this year goes, but yeah. I, I would like definitely to convert a number of my contractors to employees when, yeah. when I know the time is ready. Yeah. yeah, I would tell them that. I would be like, hey, I love what you're doing here. This is so amazing. Thank you so much for helping us out. Are you interested in ever becoming full-time? Because when we stabilize, if you can be on my team, that would rock. And they'd be like, oh. So you kind of plant the seed. Because a lot of contractors, I did the same model, right? When I started off, I had to have contractors. It's way too risky to have employees. And I was like, oh, but I need them to be engaged. And the, the reason I found contractors a little tricky to work with is because they're a one-person show. And they often have their own way of doing things, their own processes, their own time, their own way. And so to meld them into your process might be like an onboarding checklist, like here's all the things that we do at our agency that we need you to help us with. And so they can sign on early to say, okay, yeah, I gotta be online by 10 a.m. and I gotta commit code every day and I gotta be video first. And um, we have a communications charter which helps people understand where to go when and we share that with all of our contractors. So they have a clear understanding of our expectations for communications. In some ways, if you're thinking about bringing them on full-time, then almost like treat them like full-time employees with the same kind of like one-on-ones. It might not be something that you need to dive super deep, but you want to know their career paths because in that same model, working with contractors that want to stay contractors are never, they're going to be good for the time, but you might not want to focus your energy on them as much as the others. But again, telling them they rock is usually the first step to be like, oh, and then specific, like this totally rocked, this impacted this client, because of you, you did this, because of the way that you worked with the team members, this happened, they all of a sudden feel more connected. So when the time comes to be full time, like our contractors were just like, okay, we're ready, we're so excited, and we get healthcare, woo, <laughs> right? Like there's different perks that they're gonna figure out, oh, I don't have to hustle for work anymore. So. Yeah, I think a lot of these still apply, especially if you're kind of career pathing them on your direction. Um, we don't work with very many contractors anymore unless we need to. And again, we do the same onboarding process. We give them the first day checklist and we go through a bit of an onboarding process so the other team members get to know this person. Um, sometimes we do like a 20 hour week, we'll see how they work. If they work well, we'll bring them to 40 and then if they do well, we'll bring them on full time. And that process there gets them, we kind of test the waters both ways. So, good question. Start with job descriptions even if you're not ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we kind of have some problems with uh, people who, I guess they appear to lack motivation and sort of curiosity and uh, things that uh, we feel kind of like make good developers, you know, people who actually every once in a while would like to show up to a user group meeting or something like that. Um, and we're in an organization that um, it's very hard to get fired from, let's just say that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it's not probably, it's definitely not the same kind of organization as yours. Um, so uh, any ideas around kind of how to, yeah. you know, come on guys, let's come go, on you know guys. what I mean? Yeah. Do they have, I mean, do you know about their lives outside of work? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we do kind of. Yeah, because yeah? sometimes people that might not be super stoked at work, they're super stoked about something else. Yeah. So if you can find out what that something else is, and um, you know, maybe it's like a video game like Team Fortress 2, I don't know, mm -hmm. I'm really not up and up on my video games. But like maybe you can create like incentive programs to be like, oh, you know, I know you're really stoked to go windsurfing this weekend, so if we can maybe hit these targets that maybe you can take Friday afternoon off and go windsurfing. Or you can find things that more are more meaningful to them, because sometimes you can't really get a satisfied employee to engage, no matter how hard you try in those perks, you kind of have to be like, okay, this group was engaged, and I think it's, again, um, 
being transparent with them and say like, hey, Jane, we really like working with you, but I feel like you think your job sucks. Why? What, why do you feel like your job sucks? And they're like, oh, you think I think my job sucks? Oh, I thought I was just keeping status quo and nobody was noticing. You're like, it's okay if you think that it sucks, but I want to make it better. So what does that look like for you? And they'd be like, oh, well, you know, I really hate my commute. So can I work from home one day a week? And then, you're, then that might create more engagement. But sometimes it's just like asking them, like, what do you like to do outside of work? Why are you unhappy? And again, putting in those metrics, even though it's hard to fire people, they need a performance plan if they are sucking. Yeah. To say like, and, and we do 360s. So we get performance um, input from their direct manager, from their peers, and if possible, a client. And that way we have a 360 degree view of what they're doing. It's not just me being emo, aggro CEO, like this person's not doing well. It's like, okay, I have a feeling that this person's not doing well. Let's ask their manager, or let's ask their peers. And it's a good, it's like the, the shit sandwich, uh -huh. good, yeah. the bad. And it's not necessarily, people see it coming. They're like, oh, it's good. I, I pretty much like, you get the 360s, you put it together, and you go, look, we have to have a difficult conversation. I think that you know X, Y, Z is not working. Why do you think it might not be working? And if they can start to be like, oh, I'm a problem, because ultimately, if they were really unhappy, they'd quit, but they're there for some reason, and it might be the money for to go windsurfing, so just having that conversation might like bring some clarity to that and then helping with um, you know, HR or some manager to facilitate those higher conversations. Um, sometimes it's good to play good cop, bad cop, you know? And, and someone comes in and is like, okay, this is, you know, this is where we're going. And then another person comes and says, wow, that must have been really difficult for you. Are you doing okay? How can we support you? So thank you. See all this magic dust? Related. Okay. Well, if you are a larger organization, I do want to plug Know Your Company. It's something that we would love to use as a tool. It's just not big enough. We're not big enough for it, but it's a really cool tool that allows you. It's like $100 per employee for their entire life. And it sends out these welcome emails. It's really a fantastic tool. I'd highly recommend it. I'd highly recommend Hey Taco. If anybody knows of any other weird gimmicky things, that's generally um, you know, something fun to share. I'm, I'm always open to ideas. Yeah? Carmine. Awesome. So just for everybody that's going to watch this after, um, it's hip chat and it's called Karma and that's similar to the Hey Taco and it sounds like people are jazzed about that. So. It's, uh, like it's an IRC, it's a thing that I first saw on IRC. Like oh, okay. In the, in the Drupal IRC channels, people handle Karma with a plus plus. We do the same thing in Slack. Yeah. It is, it is cool. Yeah, we originally had the Karma like you add and you're like, oh, this person gets Karma, this person gets negative Karma. <laughs> the nice thing about tacos is you can't take them away. <laughs> Once I got a taco, and I can tell you the amount of tacos we've all eaten since this app has come into play. We've even renamed nachos to be deconstructed tacos. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming. Um, please, I think everybody's been saying this now. Oh, we're just going to go here, but please feel free to log online, take your survey. This was my first time presenting this, so thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> business cards and um, flyers if you know anybody that's looking for a job, specifically a UX designer. So 